Okay. Hi, my name is Leela Bridgman. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Duke University's Department of Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science um, and a member of Duke Robotics Group, although I'll primarily be talking to you not about robotics today. Um, uh, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research into distributed dissipativity, where I try to apply kind of some foundational results in um, stability theory for robust control to um, problems that are really inspired by modern network control. And so so basically, as a control theorist, I feel like you're in an audience of roboticists, so I'll kind of go to the basic inspiration of control systems. So a control system is really designed to influence the behavior of things. And that to describe what control systems are, we have to really be vague because controllers are meant to really just be used in kind of a huge diversity of applications. So we can think of a control system as being um, an autopilot that's meant to influence the behavior of a vehicle, such as an airplane or an autonomous you know, land vehicle, an autonomous sub submarine or a drone, all of those would involve control systems. You could think of a control system as something that is controlling the behavior of a robot, or you could even think of a control system in, for instance, biomedical applications. So if you have a human and you want to influence, for instance, viral load within your body, you could think of the prescriptions that are actually being given to this human being as controllers actuating upon that viral load system. And so if you're if you're thinking of something that has such diverse applications, you can really wonder what is going to unify all of this. Um, how can we kind of do anything that is useful for so many different types of application? Um, but to me, there's really one central challenge that unifies all of control systems. And that is that no matter how well, we try and model these systems, however much we study them, we're never going to understand them fully in reality. Whatever model we have for the behavior of our system, be it a human being viral load in their body, a robotic system, or um, a vehicle that we're trying to design an autopilot for, um, whatever model we have is definitely going to be wrong in practice um, because there's going to be noise, both sensor and actuator noise. There's going to be unintended inputs coming into our system from external forces or factors. There could, there's going to be unit to unit variation. So if we're thinking of prescriptions, there's differences between the human beings. If we're thinking of, for instance, vehicles coming off an assembly line, there's going to be um, differences in their parts. Um, and of course, we can think of different operating conditions our robot, for instance, could have to operate under, or we could think of changes in our system's parameters. So for instance, if you have a robotic arm and it picks up an object, that will change its moments of inertia. And so despite all of this inevitable uncertainty that we encounter, um, we have to design our controllers that are gonna be robust to those um, different sources of uncertainty. And to me, that is really one of the unifying challenges in control. And I think the, the reason why this is really such a central challenge is because, of course, if we're thinking about controlling a system, we always have some kind of performance that we're trying to optimize. So we could think of, for instance, driving a vehicle towards a desired set point. And we could naively say, oh, let's optimize our performance. Let's get this vehicle to move from point A to point B ASAP. And if you just design a controller to get that done, well, that's not so terribly hard often. Uh, but the problem is that when all of these different sources of uncertainty enter our system, if we've designed our controller for really good performance with our nominal model of the system, um, when it encounters this reality, well, because to get good performance, we usually have to design very aggressive controllers, it may overreact to noise in our system. And as a consequence, um, instead of driving our system towards point A to point B, maybe we'll have some overshoot. And 
if our controller is too aggressive, it will overreact to that overshoot, potentially inducing oscillations in our behavior. Um, sometimes our worst case scenario is we induce these repeated ongoing oscillations with growing amplitude. That's the worst case um, we are afraid of encountering as control systems and um, as control engineers. So we want to avoid that. And in order to avoid that, we have to basically choose a good compromise between our desire for good performance and our need for robustness. And in my opinion, in kind of life and in science, whenever we have to make a compromise, that's a place where we can do some, we have some interesting and difficult problems because compromise is hard, both as people and as scientists and engineers years when we have to compromise between competing objectives. And so how do we make this compromise best? Well, what we want to do is we want to sacrifice as little as possible to ensure stability, to make sure that whatever inputs we and scenarios we might reasonably encounter, those are going to result in output responses that we can reasonably accept. So that's going to be our basic criteria stability criterion and if we meet that well then we can focus on performance as much as we want um, and what we want to do to shift our focus towards performance is we first have to really precisely define what level of stability what level of robustness is good enough and so there are many different ways that people have described stability. Probably the first most common stability description that we encounter is this notion of asymptotic stability. So we want to drive our system towards some desired set point and asymptotic stability says, well, it'll eventually reach that set point as time approaches infinity. And so that's a reasonable kind of notion of stability. Um, in which may or may not be useful depending on your application. So another way of conceptualizing stability might be to say, okay, we don't actually have to reach our set point ever, but if we start adequately close to our set point, we had better stay nearby. So we're concerned, we don't have to actually ever reach there, but we have to be close enough. And the idea of Lyapunov stability is kind of the second most popular stability notion that encompasses that concept. Um, but both of these two really common stability ideas, they're really focused on stabilization around a set point, and they're focused on our system's responses to initial conditions. And so neither of them work altogether too well when we're thinking about forced systems, systems that are subject to disturbances continually with time. And so for that, I look at another notion, stability notion, which is input output stability. And so with input output stability, we have kind of an inner product space that describes our allowable inputs that we might reasonably encounter. We have an extended inner product space that encompasses the undesirable outputs that we're afraid might happen. And then we say our system is going to be input output stable if inputs in our space of reasonable inputs never result in outputs that are unreasonable. Um, so that still probably sounds like a very vague notion if you compare it to asymptotic or Lyapunov stability. Um, so to get into the math of this, um, basically, we typically say a system is input output stable if it maps inputs in the inner product space L2 to outputs in the inner product space L2. So L2 is, encompasses the behavior we might reasonably encounter um, and hope for. So L2 is, it, it's this inner product space of signals that are square integrable over all time, including infinite time. And the key property about L2 signals is that they're transient. They always eventually die out as time approaches infinity. So if, and demanding that our system be input output stable says that, hey, if we have a transient input to our system, our response had better be transient. We can't respond in perpetuity to a single input that was just temporary. So that's a pretty general stability notion. Now our, our set of 
unreasonable but possible outcomes is L2E. So that encompasses signals that are square integrable over finite time, but they may not be square integrable over infinite time. And the key thing is that L2E um, can include, for instance, exponential growth or um, growing oscillations, oscillations that continue in perpetuity, all kinds of nefarious responses that we're concerned about. Um, now, if those two don't work for you, in fact, input-output stability we can define more generally with different inner product spaces that are customized to the definition of reasonable that works for your application. Um, and the key thing about it is that input-output stability is really a property that we can analyze for both linear and nonlinear systems. And in fact, we don't even have to have a notion of a state. We just talk about how our system maps inputs to output. So for instance, if we're thinking of um, the world of like neural networks where they don't really have state space realizations associated with them, well, this is a pretty good uh, stability notion to be thinking about. Whereas the Apinov and asymptotic stability are usually associated with state space realizations. Um, and the other great thing about input output stability is that you can actually account for initial conditions, reference signals, and disturbances, all three of those things at once. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for defining stability um, for a broad array of systems. So it's, it's really versatile. Um, now, how exactly do we use input-output stability? Well, usually we use these theorems that have been developed from functional analysis. And the typical input-output stability theorem says, okay, hey, if I have a plant and it has an input-output stability property, and typically we express input-output stability properties as inner relationships between the inner products of our inputs and outputs. So over here, M would be some matrix and choosing different values for M corresponds to different input output properties in this inequality. So if we have a plant that has a one input output property, our typical stability theorem will tell us what is our desired controller input output property that will ensure closed loop input output stability. Um, so we basically, these stability theorems, we can think of them as compatibility conditions between our plants and our controllers or more generally, just compatibility conditions between interconnected systems. Um, so where has this been used? Well, one of the most popular input-output stability results is the passivity theorem. And there's numerous reasons why passivity was so popular in control systems. Um, first of all, we have this nice interpretation that passive systems are systems that don't create energy, and every passive system is going to be stable. So sometimes we can analyze passivity in place of analyzing stability. Um, the other thing is that there are many physical systems that are going to be naturally passive, and they're often passive for all possible physical parameter values. So our basic circuit elements, if you have a robotic arm or uh, that where you're mapping joint torques to joint weights, if you're doing spacecraft attitude control, again, mapping co-located torques to rates, um, many human interaction models like to haptic feedback are passive. If we have a heat exchanger model, those are passive. So there's this vast array of passive systems. And for instance, if you're looking at a robotic arm, um, its passivity property is going to hold no matter what its moments of inertia are. So if you're concerned about stabilizing a robotic arm and you're uncertain about its parameters, maybe you have a telescoping robotic arm, maybe this robotic arm is going to pick up objects that are very heavy relative to it. Passivity can guarantee stability for all those different operating conditions. So that's a pretty useful property to have. Additionally, we have these, this, these nice theorems that say, hey, if you have passive elements in parallel or in negative feedback, um, the resulting network will be passive itself and consequently stability. So that allows us to kind of, instead of doing stability on a large network of subsystems, we can analyze each subsystem um, separately and kind of do decentralized analysis 
to infer stability of the entire network. So that can give us some computationally efficient um, designs that scale well for large scale systems. Now, how do we use passivity? Well, first of all, we have this the definition of passivity. So a system is passive if the inner product between its inputs and outputs um, is non-negative, and it's very strictly passive if that inner product is bounded below by norms of its inputs and outputs squared. Um, now, the compatibility condition, the passivity theorem, tells us that our closed-loop system is input-output stable if you interconnect a passive plant with a very strictly passive controller. So those are kind of our use, some key things that we can use to work with pa passive systems. And the other side bonus about passivity is that we have actually a nice interpretation, a graphical interpretation for linear time invariant systems. So if you have a stable linear time invariant system whose Nyquist plot is in the right half plane, then it's passive. And if it's passive, its Nyquist plot is going to be in the right half plane. So passivity is pretty useful, um, pretty good for design. Um, but it can't really be used everywhere. And the reason is that in reality, we have sensor noise, actuator noise, discretizations, and delay. So although passivity can give us enormous amounts of robustness to parametric uncertainty, it doesn't give us any robustness to some of these. Even an infinitesimal delay will cause a passivity violation. So in some sense, although passive, passive systems are real, passivity violations are a real problem. Um, so what what can we do then? Well, the problem of dealing with passivity violations really inspired me to look at more general input output stability properties than most people have looked at in the past. And the next most simplest um, result we can look at is conic sectors. So for a memoryless system, if it was single input, single output, we could plot our outputs as a function of our inputs. And if our system was conic, then that plot would be bounded by two sectors, uh, bounded within a sector um, where it's bounded below by a line with slope A and above by a, a line with slope B if that system is in the cone from A to B. And then the, the compatibility condition says that if you have the negative inverse of your controller, if it is in the complement of your plant cone, then you will have closed loop input output stability. Um, now we can translate that criterion on the negative inverse of your controller to actually find this relatively simple uh, compatibility condition that you want your controller to be, if your plant is in the cone from A to B, you want your controller to be in the cone with the negative, recipro negative reciprocals of those plant conic bounds. So that's a nice, simple compatibility condition between plants and controllers to ensure closed loop stability. And the beauty of this is that we're analyzing closed loop stability, but we only have to look at the open loop properties of the plant operating on its own and the controller operating on its own. We don't have to understand the full interconnection. So we're kind of able to decompose our analysis into piece, separate pieces to make our life a little bit easier. Okay, so now why exactly is this a natural extension to look at when we're thinking of passivity violations? Well, so that we can look at the graphical interpretations of conic sectors. So if a system is in the cone from A to B, a stable linear time invariant system will have a Nyquist plot in a circle centered on the real ax axis intersecting the real axis at A and B. Um, if it's exterior to that cone, well, its Nyquist plot is going to be outside of that circle. So we have these nice graphical interpretations. And now we can go back to the graphical interpretation of passivity. So we know that if a system is passive, its Nyquist plot is going to be in the right half plane. But we can just think of that right half plane as being a degenerate circle centered on the real axis, intersecting the real axis at zero and infinity. And Hence, we can think of passive systems as actually being conic in the cone from zero to infinity. And if we look at the mathematical definition of passivity, compare it to the mathematical definition of conic sectors, that intuition is confirmed. It, it holds true. 
So now if we think about a passivity violated system, well, we expect its Nyquist plot is no longer gonna lie in the right half plane. It'll poke a little bit into the left half plane. So now it'll be in a half plane bounded below by some negative value in A instead of zero and um, still bounded above potentially by infinity. So passivity violated, a violated system, we expect it'll be in the cone from negative, some negative A value to infinity. So we can care, start to describe passivity violations in terms of conic sectors. So that's why we have this natural connection between these two system descriptions. Now, in, in terms of input output stability theory, over the years, um, people have kind of developed this cornucopia, a whole landscape of theorems um, to describe different system qualities. So um, after passivity gain, conic sectors, um, people have introduced ideas like passivity indices that characterize excesses or shortages in passivity. Um, there's beta bounds that merge these ideas of gain and passivity Gamma passivity was designed to incorporate phase information alongside passivity information. Um, the list goes on. The next, I think, most important um, stability notion is really QSR dissipativity um, that is designed for non-square systems. And we can think of it as characterizing, for instance, conic properties of different input-output pairings. Um, for a given system. Integral quadratic constraints, um, I think of those as being time or frequency varying input output properties. And then the mother of all stability theorems is the graph separation theorem that gives um, necessary and sufficient conditions for stability. But the key difficulty with graph separation is that we don't have always great ways of verifying graph separation and actually analyzing that property. Um, and that kind of hints at the problem that I encountered. So I basically spent my doctoral work studying conic sectors and I saw all these beautiful generalizations, this landscape of theorems, and I was really left scratching my head of why aren't these theoretically more powerful results used when passivity and small gain are used with relative frequency. And I kind of came, I came to the conclusion that there were four big factors that were limiting the use, like how people exploit the theor theoretical power of input output stability theory. So first of all, there's a simple lack of practical applications and interpretations that people have identified for these more general input output notions. Second, um, some of these ideas there, it's not easy to identify graph separation if people haven't found a way of verifying gamma passivity, no one's going to take advantage of a theorem related to that. So we need better ways of identifying these input output properties. Third, a lot of input output results have kind of garnered this reputation as being very conservative. So if, you, if you're relying on input output stability theory to guarantee robustness, often people think you have to sacrifice a lot of performance for that robustness. Um, so that is definitely a hindrance to this getting used. And then fourth of all, there is kind of just a lack of practical controller design methods um, to impose QSR properties or conic properties or any of these input output results. Um, and so my goal has really been trying to work on these four issues to bridge the gap between these fundamental results and the technologies that I think they could enable. So I'm gonna go through with kind of one main application in mind um, and talk about how I've tried to kind of address each of these four issues through some of my research. Um, so the first thing is this lack of applications and the application that I found really inspiring um, most re recently has been thinking about how we can control the modern power grid. So when I'm thinking of the modern power grid, one of the things I'm thinking about is how we're trying to incorporate more and more renewable energy sources into the grid. And that is associated with kind of two um, big changes. First of all, these power sources are distributed throughout the grid instead of more centralized locations. 
And second of all, if you compare renewable energy sources to conventional energy sources, the renewable sources actually have more significant nonlinear dynamics. And so whereas previously we could rely on linear stability analysis, um, now we have to really use um, techniques that are applicable to nonlinear systems. And hence, this is a real opportunity to use input output results that are, you know, designed exactly for nonlinear systems. The other really important connection is that this is a large scale problem. And so that points to maybe a passivity based approach being uh, being nice because it can decompose your nonlinear analysis. And then the third <laughs> very concrete uh, reason is that I saw this paper back in 2018 where someone had actually analyzed conic properties of um, a standard test system. And so with that, I really, really got me interested in this. Um, and But in order to really apply input output stability results to this, there's a few big challenges. So first of all, although we would naturally want to use a passivity based approach for this large scale system, um, there are definitely going to be commu communication delays between our different nodes because the system is not just large scale in terms of having many states, but it's also geographically large scale. The nodes are distant from one another, so there are going to be communication delays. And even an infinitesimally small communication delay is going to cause a passivity violation. Now, these are not infinitesimally small delays, uh, so the passivity violations could be significant. So we really need some of these more interesting parts of our, our landscape of theorems. Um, but within those, we need methods for analysis and controller synthesis that are gonna be computationally efficient for these large scale systems. And we need a way, a, a distributed way of kind of analyzing input output properties. So to me, this application is well suited to these, the, well, these strategies are really well suited to this problem and it encompasses some interesting challenges. So in addressing these challenges, I kind of have to address our tip, these four problems. And so the second of the four problems was this lack of easy ways to identify input output properties. And so before I can talk about how I work to address this, I'll talk about what people have done so far. So back in the 90s, early 2000s, um, people, uh, Gupta and Joshi, they develop, they derived linear matrix inequalities that allowed us to identify um, conic properties of sta stable linear time invariant systems. And, and so that is a really useful technique for, as long as you have a state space realization for your system to identify uh, conic properties. Uh, now associated with this, we have this problem of deciding how should we characterize our plant? So as soon as you have a Nyquist plot here, I have it encircled by this circle, but I could also encircle it by a circle that ha intersects the real axis maybe a little, a little closer on the negative side and a little further on the right hand side. There's many circles that encircle this Nyquist plot. So we have to ask, which is the best conic characterization of our plant. And towards that, Gupta and Joshi suggested minimize, minimizing the plant conic radius. So trying to find the circle with the smallest possible radius that would encircle this Nyquist plot to really characterize it as tightly as possible. And although that's a really good general purpose um, heuristic to choose your characterization, um, it might not always be the best possible thing we can do. So if we're thinking towards how can we characterize our plans so that we can maximize our design freedom while designing stabilizing controllers, what we really would want to do is choose a plant characterization that maximizes the radius of the conic sector that our controller can lie in while still ensuring closed loop stability. But the problem is that when you pose that as your objective, you don't you you end up with a non-convex optimization problem, and so then what do you do? You, you can't opt. <laughs> you don't have a nice well-posed optimization problem. 
And so instead we have to rely on some heuristics to make our choice. And for um, the problem of systems with passivity violations, we actually have some nice intuition we can use. So as we, uh, in, if we look at a, a, a mild passivity violation, what we hope is that our Nyquist plot will just barely poke into the left half plane. And hence, if we find, if we maximize the lower conic bound um, of the conic circle encircling our Nyquist plot, we can maybe drive that lower conic bound very close to the imaginary axis, um, basically making it very small in magnitude. And if we, if we do that, well, the desired, the controller's desired upper conic bound is the negative reciprocal of the plant's lower conic bound. And so if we can drive this number very close to zero, well, then the upper conic bound grows much, much larger. And so that can give us a, a hugely larger conic radius for our desired controller conic sector, giving us a lot more design freedom and resulting in better performance of our stabilizing controller. So this kind of addresses um, both how do we identify conic properties, but how do we choose them to reduce our conservatism? Now, before I talk about any results related to this, I wanna give a little bit more of the, the theory we developed for anal analysis. So um, specifically in these, um, in the power systems example, we're concerned about delays between our subsystems, be between our nodes. And so to confront this issue, I developed linear matrix inequality constraints to identify conic properties of uh, linear time invariant systems that are subject to input, output, and state, state delays. And here I'm just going to reproduce um, the linear ma the matrix inequality constraints for um, constant um, constant delays. But my former master's student Zeng Gong, um, who's now at UC San Diego doing his doctorate, he actually developed. Um, a tech, a linear matrix inequality constraints to identify conic bounds of systems with um, input and output delays that are time varying. Uh, so that was a really nice extension he did. But uh, these are the matrices involved in identifying with constant delays, and they just get significantly worse and can't fit on a slide when you have time varying delays. So this was, I think, an important contribution um, for this network control application. Uh, but to make it really work well, we want to think a little bit about reducing conservatism further. And so for that, I want to compare kind of the two big perspectives on input-output stability theory. So the most common perspective on how we use input-output stability theory um, is really kind of the foundation of H infinity control, if <laughs> you're familiar with that. That's, I think, one of our most familiar robust control techniques for nonlinear systems. Um, and uh, basically what we do in each infinity control is we have, uh, we consider the interconnection between our controller and a nominal plant model. And then we group all of the different sources of uncertainty into what we call a delta block uh, that is interconnected with this plant and nominal controller. And in each infinity optimal control, what we do is we look at the interconnection between our plant and our nominal, our nominal plant model and our controller, and we try and minimize its gain in order to maximize the allowable gain of our uncertainty block, effectively maximizing our robustness to uncertainty. But if we don't want to kind of be overly robust so that we can really kind of uh, get good performance, then we want to do something else. And so what I look, what I really look at doing is saying, okay, let's take a, an uncertain plant model and try and characterize this uncertain plant model's input output characteristics, and then find input output 
characteristics of our controller that will ensure closed loop stability. And the beauty of this is that we never have to consider what is the closed loop input output properties of anything. So for the typical approach, we have to consider the closed loop between a plant model and a controller. And in this, we look at our two systems behavior separately for input output characterization. Um, and then the other kind of great thing about this is that from this perspective, I can actually choose where I group my uncertainty. So I can group certain factors with my controller and certain factors with my plant and basically try and do the analysis that is easiest possible or least conservative um, for a given application. So we have this kind of customizability and the ability to decompose our analysis into subsystems. And so to me, that's key to making our analysis a little bit easier, more customizable, and consequently a little less conservative. Okay, so what is the results associated with this? Well, one small example I looked at was considering um, control of a heat exchanger. The reason I looked at this is because back um, Bao and Lee pointed out that heat exchangers are going to be passive, and in fact they're passive for many different choices of inputs and outputs. Um, but one difficulty is that in fact the inlet temperatures, which are control variables, um, there's always going to be a delay in between um, giving a command and actually being able to cool our inlet stream or heat our inlet stream in response to that command. And so hence, there's this input delay in the system. And when you account for that input delay, you of course encounter passivity violations. So what I looked at was um, three different ways of designing controls for this. First of all, you design an H2 optimal controller that would be passive and would be guaranteed to stabilize your system. And what we see is that as the, in, the delay in the inlet stream increases, um, the performance of this supposedly H2 optimal controller degrades, it gets really, really worse, and eventually for high enough delays, it stops stabilizing the system, you encounter instabilities. Um, now, if we look at the conic properties of this um, time delayed system, uh, then you can design an H2 optimal controller that has desired conic bounds. Or you could look at using, for instance, the very popular DK algorithm to design um, uh, H-infinity style robust controller that accounts for this delay. And so what we found was from the conic perspective, we get better performance than the DK technique. Um, we still get stability. And both of these two input output robust techniques really have much better performance than the H2 optimal controller as your delays get larger and larger. Um, so that was kind of a really nice finding. We're able to drive our conservatism down a little bit, but still get robustness to these delays. So where do we go from here? So the, the fourth real key element to making um, input output stability theory more practical is developing design methods. And for our networked control, the really key missing piece is design methods um, that will work with large scale systems. And so my doctoral student, Ethan Lo Cicero, has been studying how we can do um, sparse designs, uh, for sparse input output designs for large scale systems. And so to do this, he's really been faced with four questions. First of all, how can we design dissipative or uh, dissipative controllers or controllers with more generally desired input output properties? How can we combine our different performance metrics with our robustness criteria? And then for the large scale problem, um, basically you end up with these large scale LMIs and that encode our input output properties. So how can we solve these very large LMIs? And finally, how can we kind of incorporate communication costs into our objective functions um, so that we're selecting um, controllers that you know, are actually implementable for these large scale systems? And so, Towards, so the words answering this question, first I want to talk about the, the performance metric that we've kind of studied the most. 
and that is um, the H2 optimal, op the H2 norm as our performance metric. Um, so the H2 norm, in H2 optimal control, we have kind of the, these response, we want to, for single input, single output systems, we can think of minimizing the closed loop norm as minimizing the magnitude of response to noise across all frequencies of noise. Um, now, the great thing about H2 optimal control that's very convenient is that for a linear time invariant plant, um, we actually know we can calculate the H2 optimal controller just by solving a couple of algebraic Riccati equations. So that's really nice and relatively easy to do. Um, and then we look at kind of the dream of H2 conic control. And I'll, I'll talk about conic bounds, but we could think about H2 IQC design or H2 graph separation or H2 QSR dissipativity. Um, but H2 conic is kind of the simplest um, first example that we can look at. Um, so our objective here, our dream scenario would be to minimize the closed loop H2 norm, but subject to the constraint that our controller satisfies conic bounds that will ensure stability with our plant. And the great thing about this is that for the H2 norm, we're gonna probably have to calculate it for some nominal linear model of our plant, but these conic bounds could hold true for our nonlinear model. So we can kind of decompose, the, we can separate the model that we use for analyzing robustness to from the model that we use for analyzing performance. So that's nice, but the problem is, this doesn't, this isn't a nice well-posed optimization problem. So the first strategy we could look at, we did look at, is making some assumptions on the structure of our controller. You know, does, if we have a state space, some state space matrices, maybe we may choose some of them a priori. Well, I've never seen anyone, I, I don't know of anyone who ever was successful in that strategy alone. They've never, no one's ever formulated um, a nice well-posed optimization problem, a convex one with that strategy by itself. So instead what we do is we replace our objective function, the closed loop H2 norm. Well, instead we minimize an upper bound on that H2 norm, and then we iteratively tighten the upper bound. Um, and with that solution, we can formulate a nice optimization problem. So one of the strategies we looked at is we have this H2 optimal controller and it has an observer-based structure. So we choose our conic controller to have that same observer-based structure and we can give it all the same state space matrices as our optimal controller, um, but we're gonna allow this feedback matrix C, oops, to be a design variable. And so that's the structure of controller that we chose. Our objective function, we can use this J um, expressed here to bound the closed loop H2 norm above as long as this overbounding constraint holds. And this overbounding constraint, naturally, it's bilinear in a new design variable W and our um, feedback matrix, which is our other design variable. But that's OK. We can turn this into a linear constraint by introducing a new parameter K, uh, a new design variable that is our feedback matrix times W. And then it becomes a linear matrix inequality in our design variables. Um, now, to impose the conic constraints, we can use these conic linear matrix inequalities reformulated from the ones that Gupta and Joshi introduced in the 90s. but um, basically the same thing. And for those, we have to introduce a new uh, design, a positive definite uh, matrix design variable P. And like, just like the overbounding constraint, this isn't naturally linear in these two design variables, but it's okay because we can introduce a new design variable K that is our feedback matrix times P. And then this becomes a linear matrix inequality in the new design variables. The only snag is that if I minimize this objective subject to the overbounding constraint and the conic constraint separately, we end up with two definitions of our feedback matrix C sub zero, one coming from the overbounding constraint, 
one coming from the conic constraint. And so what we do, the easiest solution to this problem is we set P equal to W in order to make those two definitions agree. But setting P equal to W does incur a bunch of conservatism and basically all of the iterative schemes um, will successively relax this assumption. And there's also other ways um, to do kind of full scale design where we allow all of the controller state space matrices to be design variables. You just end up with significant ugly, significantly uglier LMIs that I don't wanna explain in a seminar talk and, and no one wants to go through that math really um, in a seminar. Uh, but if you would enjoy seeing it, you can, uh, I'd be happy to share the publication. Um, but once we solve that problem, well, we're stuck with these, oops, sorry, got lost here. We're stuck with these linear matrix inequalities. And if we have a large scale system, P and W and C, these are going to be all large matrices with many, many entries of unknowns. And so we have to ask, how can we actually make these linear matrix inequalities practical to solve? And so what we can do is um, what my student looked at doing was basically saying, okay, if we have a plant and it's actually a bunch of interconnected subsystems, we how can we design a controller that has a given, uh, yeah, a, a structured controller and what communication structure of controller is going to allow us to have relatively few interconnections, both to reduce our computation costs and our communication costs once we're running this controller. Um, but how can we also get good performance and robustness out of this controller at the same time? And so the kind of associated design problem, this um, sparse H2 conic design problem, uh, what we did is we augmented our H2 norm objective with a term that balances it against cardinality, um, cardinality of our communication graph. And then we want to minimize that objective subject to the constraint that our controller satisfies desired conic bounds. But as you might guess, this doesn't end up with a nice well-posed optimization strategy, uh, well-posed optimization problem. And so the, then we could look at, okay, well, let's use the strategy from the previous slide. Let's make some assumptions on the structure of our controller, and then we'll iteratively tighten um, an upper bound on our closed loop H2 norm. Well, that's still not a well-posed optimization problem once you add that cardinality term. And, um, yeah, so there are kind of two possible solutions. One of them is to use the alternating direction method of multipliers, ADMM, to solve this optimization problem. And then the other one is to approximate your cardinality function. And so one of the approximation schemes we looked at was approximating it with an, a weighted L1 norm. Now, approximating it with the weighted L1 norm, you just have an the L1 norm over here and apply the strategy I described on the previous slide. So that's relatively easy. With ADMM, it's a little more complicated. So we take our objective function from the previous slide. Here we're grouping our overbounding and conic constraints. And here's our cardinality term. And basically what we do is we introduce two versions of our conic feedback matrix. One that would be a conic controller and one that would be a sparse controller. And then we augment our Lagrangian um, with, a, uh, with some terms. And those terms basically force our conic feedback matrix and our sparse feedback matrix to agree with one another. So now that we have this augmented optimization problem, then ADMM, um, basically splits up the optimization into three phases that repeat. So the first phase is the conic update, where we allow the <clears throat> conic feedback matrix to be, we treat it as a design variable, and we pretend that the sparse feedback matrix is a constant, and we try and optimize our objective function. Then, once we're done that optimization, 
we update our cardinality feedback matrix. And luckily that minimization problem, actually it has an analytical solution. So we can just use that to find our new cardinality um, feedback. And then third of all, we update our Lagrange multipliers. And then you basically cycle through repeat repeating these optimizations until um, F and G agree with one another. And there you have it, your sparse conic controller. And so what were the results of this? Well, basically the cool thing we found was that here this black line represents the closed loop H2 norm with a target controller with the same observer structure that we chose a priori. And so that is kind of the best possible performance we could hope our controller to have, would have. And what we see is that we looked at penalizing cardinality more and more and more. And so what, and what ended up happening was we could actually vastly reduce the number of communication links in our controller with very little change in our performance. Um, and a, but then eventually you ask your system to be more and more sparse, eventually having less communication, you do hit, take hits in terms of performance. But that was what came out of this. Um, and the other really surprising observation we had was because when we looked in this kind of sparsity promotion communication literature, we found that ADMM seemed to be a really popular technique, maybe the really popular popular technique. And what we were shocked to see is when we looked at a bunch of different kind of allowable communication structures. So we, we said we want a given sparsity level and we exhaustively searched through what was the best possible performance we could get with a given sparsity level. Well, at every given sparsity level, um, the way the simpler technique of replacing your cardinality, just approximating it with a weighted L1 norm, was outperforming ADMM at each sparsity level. And so we were kind of really shocked to find this beautiful scenario where the easier thing to do actually worked out better. So I don't know, that that just felt so fortuitous and surprising to me. Um, but yeah, so those were our results with this design method. Now, the next steps that we're looking towards is we want to take kind of some more interesting performance objectives, more realistic performance objectives. And so specifically, if we're in this regime where we have unreliable plant models, or if it's really difficult to define optimality, because of course, each to optimality is not really the right notion of performance for every system. Well, one other, another technique that we've been exploring is doing imitation learning control where your objective function is you effectively want to minimize your deviation from um, kind of expert demonstrations. And then we could look at de designing a controller um, that satisfies given conic bounds, but um, minimizes this learning objective function. And the beauty of this is that now, not only do we not really need to rely on some linear model for our robustness criteria, but we don't need to rely on a linear model for our performance objective either. So these two ideas seem very compatible between input output stability and learning techniques. Um, because basic and and if we look at the two different possibilities of input output perspective, um, this perspective where we we decompose kind of group our uncertainty with different plants or different controllers, and don't need to look at a closed loop um, behavior with a nominal plant model. This is again really compatible with this scenario where we're saying we don't have a good nominal plant model model to define optimization, nor do we have one to define robustness. So that's why these two perspectives, I believe, will marry very well with one another. Um, now, the next challenge that we could look at once we can design, learn, 
our typical controller structures, state space ones. Um, the next natural thing is to say, okay, how can we look at neural network controllers that are robust and learned? And for that, we're gonna really have to combine the networked analysis techniques that um, my student Ethan has been developing with um, you know, the learning-based techniques that my newest student Amy has been developing. So that's kind of the next step in this uh, robust design that we've been looking towards. And with that, I really want to thank you for coming to uh, learn a little bit about my research. And I also want to give a thank you to um, my wonderful students, not just um, Amy and Ethan, whose research I got to touch on today, but um, my other students, so Siobhan Oka, who is working, I, I'm, she's co-supervised with myself and another uh, professor here at Duke. Um, so she's been studying been developing a robot that can perform autonomous ultrasound scanning. Uh, scanning. Uh, my student, uh, Reza Labe, who has been studying uh, how we can develop uh, control Lyapunov functions um, or control barrier functions for nonlinear systems. And um, his the cool thing about his techniques are that they don't rely on kind of these a priori assumptions of a known control Lyapunov function um, compared to kind of other control barrier methods. Um, and finally, there's my student Richard Hall, who he's interested in constrained control for systems whose dynamics can change really abruptly or whose constraints can switch kind of at the drop of a hat. So yeah, that is an overview of not just my research I got to talk about, but the other things going on in my lab. So thank you again. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I see a hand up. Hi. Hi. I had a question about the last part, uh, especially the sparsity inducing uh, control. So what is the main motivation there for inducing sparsity? Uh, so there is the one of in the what I described one of the biggest reasons we want to do that is because basically if our controller in this picture the red lines represent the commands that are coming our, from our controller to different systems mm -hmm. and so if we have a controller that's kind of uh, has a lot of connections to different subsystems, that means that we're going to have to have a lot of actuators. And if these subsystems are distant from one another, we're going to have a lot of communication uh, links and like basically a lot of bandwidth requirements if they're communicating wirelessly. Um, so there's a whole bunch of costs associated with communication. And then if we're thinking in terms of networks, and for instance, like security or privacy, you know, every additional link is kind of a point of vulnerability. So there's a whole lot of reasons why we would want sparsity for that. Um, now, the other perspective um, that our more recent papers have taken that I didn't really get into here is that solving these LMIs, basically you end up with like these are monsters mm -hmm. and you have so many design variables and you can't really do, you, you can't solve these huge, huge LMIs. Mm -hmm. And so then what we've looked at is how can we choose the structure of let's say our, this unknown matrix P or our unknown matrix C mm -hmm. while kind of minimizing our, like minimizing our impact on performance. And so in practice, we wanted to look first at like the whole centralized problem to try and figure out what kinds of structures were actually good for performance so that we could build up intuition as to how we can choose these structures a priori for larger scale systems. Okay, so a uh, couple of things. So number of inputs are kind of fixed in this, right? So the links are basically just going to uh, affect the dependence of these inputs on different variables of your network. Yeah. And I, isn't the case that the conic uh, constraints take care of the delays that you, so they are designing a controller accounting for the delays, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you could do so that. So even if the controller is not sparse, no, uh, sparse, even then you would have a controller which works with the delays. Yeah. Uh, so I guess sparsity inducing robustness makes sense. Uh, the other uh, aspect was computation, as you were saying, but just uh, having a objective function which induces sparsity does that lead to reduction in computation so, like does it is it the case so, that the optimization converges faster so for if we do the sparsity promotion it will not mm -hmm. make the optimize this optimization mm -hmm. problem any faster, any faster. it yeah. will it will allow our online computations as we're running the computer yeah. to happen faster yeah. um now what my student found when he was trying to study, let's say if we choose a sparse structure for our P matrix or W matrix here, um, some structures are better than others. So if he takes into account like uh, clique structures within our, our, um, our, net, our communication graph basically, then you can get actually much faster computations and yeah, so so basically he the typical LMI problem, if if let's say P is n by n, then the number of computations required to solve these LMIs is order of n to the power of six. And by taking into account structure, in some cases he can drive it down to order of n to the power of three. So mm -hmm. So he can get some pretty good. Um, but those structures are then designed from heuristics or the structures are designed by solving similar optimization problems? Um, so, so this is the key. This is like the key next step we have to figure out is like the structure that makes thing, our computations easy is not necessarily the best structure for performance. So the thing that he's looking at now is like <laughs> right right now is how do we kind of seek out these structures? And so one thing we've been looking towards is kind of genetic algorithms where you choose your structure a priori and then you have you look at a few possibilities and then you look at combined ones and and yeah, move that. So so in my research as well, I've been looking at uh, basically optimal control problems and mm -hmm. for robotic systems and trying to break down these optimal control problems into lower dimensional sub problems where the policy computation for different inputs is either decoupled or cascaded. And yeah. it gives rise to basically network structure where different parts of your system are dependent, like different inputs are dependent on different parts of your system. Yeah. And in our case as well, what we found was uh, like these gradient free methods, uh, actually, I mean, that's kind of what you resort to towards the end. So trading, yeah. like trying to find good structures uh, such, uh, while trading off computation and optimality. So, but yeah, I was just curious because uh, this, we were also yeah. looking at this uh, optimization based formulation and uh, yeah, I was just curious if, if it's actually possible to pose it this way, although very different, like, yeah, I think power networks uh, and the kind of applications mm -hmm. that I was looking at were very different, but it boils down to a very similar uh, problem. Yeah, it's interesting. I I hadn't really thought about this at all for robotic systems until about two or three weeks ago when we okay. had a seminar speaker here at Duke talking about how he was decomposing robot models. And then I, I've been okay. really interested in whether this perspective can work for robot systems like and and kind of analyzing input output properties of subsystems of your robot and yeah, I'd be yeah. happy to chat more offline if uh, it should be interesting. Yeah. yeah, I would like to do that. Sure. Thank you. Mm. Was there um, any other questions? All right, well, we'll wrap up there then. We, we thank you for a great talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you all for coming again. And um, yeah, I guess Ashwin, we can, uh, uh, I'll I'll send you an email. I get or right. yeah, I, I can send. Uh, I'll send you an email. We can set up a time whenever it's convenient for you. Yeah.
Okay, yeah, that would be nice. Right. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon then. <laughs>